Okay, so if we talk about the climate forcing between 1750 and 2011, we get 2.25 watts per square meter um, is the total anthropogenic forcing or human caused forcing. And then we can divide that up into the greenhouse gas component and we can see the effect of the, the negative forcing effect from, um, from aerosols and from clouds and the interactions between aerosols and cr clouds. Of course, you need aerosols, cloud condensation nuclei in order for the clouds to form. So there's a connection there between them. Um, and if you take all of these things and add them up, um, subtract off the negative forcings, then you get a net forcing of 2.25 watts per square meter averaged over the surface of the planet. Um, and that forcing. Okay, so these are the greenhouse gases. Uh, these are, this is over the last 800,000 years on this side from Antarctic ice core records. And these are the, these are the values um, from 1750 on, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so we can see the CO2 rising, methane and nitrous oxide components rising. Um, Okay, so that's putting them all on one plot. This is a radiative forcing from the CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and all the other gases put together. Um, and if you change the scale here and go to a uh, log, okay, a logarithmic axis here, um, then you can get, you can see all of the other um, components, which would be too low here to see. They all combine into the others curve. So the halo carbon, CFCs, HFCs, etc. So so-called minor gases. This is another view, uh, breakdown into all the different uh, uh, molecular species. And this is a change in radiative forcing. And what we can see is the change is being increasing and increasing and increasing. And the CO2 component is red methane is green, nitrous oxide is blue, and the others are, are, are uh, here in brown. Okay, so if you look at the time evolution of the forcings from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you get this type of curve here. This is the total anthropogenic um, effective radiative forcing, and this is a total forcing, is the, the, the black um, dashed line, which includes the drops from the different volcanic spikes. When there's a large volcano going off, it puts sulfur dioxide up into the stratosphere, causes cooling, and you get these spikes. <coughs> so you can divide these forcings up. You can see the solar effect, the 11-year uh, sunspot cycle, black carbon, stratospheric water increasing. We're getting more water in the stratosphere, which is, which is adding to the effect. Um, tropospheric ozone, um, other well-mixed greenhouse gases, so that's the methane, nitrous oxide, etc. This is the CO2. And then, and then on the negative side, you have the aerosols. Then you have the aerosol cloud interactions. You have land use changes, stratospheric ozone, and the volcanic component. Okay, so when you add up all those, then you get this curve here. Um, you get the black uh, curve here, the total. Uh, effective radiative forcing over time since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, these are the, uh, this is the CO2 fluxes um, in gigatons of CO2 per year. And you can see, you know, the components from fossil fuels and in industry are ever increasing. And this is our whole problem. This is the land use changes, the land sinks, the atmosphere, and the ocean sinks. So the problem is if the CO2 concentrations keep increasing in the atmosphere, you know, when we increase 3.3 parts per million, this is, uh, this is, the problem is, is that the sinks, the ocean, and the forests, etc., that are absorbing the CO2 are weakening, and this is very bad news for us. Um, this is the, uh, this, this chart you often see this is with all this is the temperature with all of the forcings and if you take out the anthropogenic component and just have natural forcings only you would have a blue line here so this is what we observe this is what we would have which is natural forcings obviously there's not a match here you need to you know the forcings the anthropogenic forcings from greenhouse gases increases give us 
a good match here to what's happening. If you just have natural forcings, it doesn't match the observations at all. Okay, this is showing, um, so this is showing the, uh, this is the greenhouse gas, um, the, the increase in temperature from greenhouse gases. This is all anthropogenic forcings combined here. Um, this is what we observe. Um, so this is, uh, so, okay, so this is, if we just, the, the internal variability is there, but it's small, okay? These are just natural forcings, they're small. The, we can only explain the large increase in temperature from the greenhouse gas, um, the greenhouse gas increase in the atmosphere. Um, so this is uh, the global surface temperature increasing, the solar component, uh, there's a cycle, the volcanic component, natural variability. Okay, so if you take this and subtract out all of these other components, here, the solar, the volcanic, the natural variability, you get the anthropogenic component, which is from us humans. Okay, so there's all kinds of different computer models that you can do to do projections and things. I won't go too much into that. This is just showing the different scenarios, low emission scenario with um, net um, negative emissions technology. Um, assumed and then the higher emission scenarios and you can see the different curves coming up and the different temperatures so in order to stay you know to, I mean we probably we've, we've blown past you know there's no 1.5 degrees you know the Paris objective forget it 1.5 Celsius 2 degrees very you know almost impossible to, to reach but we still have to try um, even with the, you know, we, in order to do that, I mean, 80% emissions reduction by 2050, that's about 5% a year, you know, we need at least 6 or 7% a year to get to a reduction of emissions, and we're, we're going in the opposite direction, so, you know, we're not uh, anywhere close to achieving this. Um, this is sort of a bit about models and what's in there, you know, some of the original climate models, not done with computers, obviously, you know, radiative transfer, then you need to include the, the air movements and the ocean movements and the interactions, the hydrological cycle, the sea ice and land surface, the atmospheric chemistry, aerosols and vegetation, bio um, geochemical cycles, you know, so you have these total earth system models. So the models are getting more and more sophisticated, but it's the observations tell. So here's an earlier model with the grid size is pretty large. As you get smaller and smaller grid size, you get more and more detailed results in your in your model and over time you know as we learn more and more the scientific uncertainty um, component can be reduced and the internal variability we can understand a bit more and model for so we have different uncertainty in the scenarios than you know the emission scenarios so this is sort of as you move in time the fraction of the total variability that you see varies depending on um, you know, these three parameters. Okay, this is uh, sort of some of the things, some of the air, the atmospheric circulation, um, showing you the Hadley cells, the feral cells, the polar cells, you know, the subtropical jet streams, the polar jet streams in both hemispheres, and then this is a cross-section looking at it, equator, warm air rises, you get these cells forming. So as we change the temperature balance between the equator and the Arctic, then these cells shift, the Hadley cell will expand, the jet stream shift and slow down and become wavier, et cetera. This is, this is an excellent diagram here for uh, you know, seeing some of those processes. Um, of course, natural variability, one of the biggest things is the El Nino versus La Nina, and there's certain patterns, you know, um, because the ocean temperature the, the, you know, in the Pacific, the warm air, the warm water will shift over to the east off of uh, South America for, for El Nino's and, and uh, you know, that the opposite happens. The water is colder off South America in La Nina's and that affects North America in different ways. It has global implications, but we're focusing on the U.S. here. <coughs> so this is things, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I mentioned has certain parameters, certain effects on November and March precipitation to, and temperature, winter precipitation and temperature, and so has different effects. And um, 
This is another index. Um, Northern Pacific index has other effects, um, other patterns that generally happen in the winter in the U.S. when these conditions are, are met. So this is natural variability. And this is just some model simulation showing some of the different conditions, you know, the precipitation, uh, air temperatures, sea, uh, air temperature, and sea level pressure, uh, winds, etc. These are uh, temperature changes expected in the U.S. Winter temperatures to increase, um, summer temperatures not so much, and this is overall temperature. So the winters get really, really warmer. Uh, much more so than the summers, you know, although there's a, a distribution from east to west, etc. Um, these are temperature anomalies uh, over the last century or so. Um, so this is a pollen record. Um, the, I believe this is tree rings. This is instrumentation, instrumental records, and then there's uncertainties associated with it and so on. Um, these are some of the changes that we're seeing. So we're getting changes in the statistics of weather. For example, the coldest temperatures of the year are increasing and, and uh, they've increased at greater than six degrees for the red spots. And we're seeing the coldest temperatures increasing over time. Um, the warmest temperature records, you know, in the past we've had many, you know, sort of very, very, you know, you get a warm day here. So those records aren't being broken as as much we're getting overall warming um <clears throat> i'm a bit surprised by by this particular data i have to think about that more carefully um we're getting basically more daily record highs and uh less of the daily record lows that's what this curve is showing um these are some of the temperature distribution trends the further up north you go the warmer it becomes Okay, so this is some observation and models to try to match the observations. These are projected changes, um, mid 21st century, low emission scenario higher, um, and late 21st century. We don't want to go here. We definitely don't want to go here. Um, these are projected changes in the coldest temperature of the year um, from three different models, the three warmest models, and changes in the um, warmest temperature of the year from three different models and from a weighted average. Okay, so we've got all these different model runs of showing how things play out um, across the country, both for temperature and this is for precipitation. So these are areas, so winter precipitation, uh, the, the, these are, these are uh, it's getting drier for the brown and it's getting wetter for the blue. So wetter here, drier here and there's seasonal variation. So spring precipitation high here, lower here, fall precipitation really high. So there's variations from seasons and these are changes in inches of rainfall in different parts of the country. So different hydrology, two day precipitation events that are happening more and more frequently. So torrential rain events are happening more and more frequently. Heavy precipitation events happening more and more frequently at least you know, on the eastern part of the country, and some drops in the uh, in the uh, southwest. Um, these are different projected changes across North America in seasonal precipitation. So here we go. As you go further north, you get warm. You get more and more precipitation. Um, in summer, you get very dry areas here, and in the fall, you get more. Okay, so more. Um, there's some seasonal variation. Um, this is separating into the different regions. The precipitation increases um, from year to year and, and projected out into the future. Um, again, 20 year events, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have much more tor torrential rain events as climate warms. Change in the percentage. Um, so the top, the, the top, these are the fiercest um, precipitation. Uh, events and we'll get more and more of these um, the change in number as a percentage goes way way up for the most extreme of the extreme events but even with all that precipitation because of the rise in temperature we're getting drying of the soils you know throughout most of the different seasons and this is going to affect crop production and greatly decrease yields and this is a snowpack decreasing um, modeled um, over um, over over time um, and this is showing, um, 
you know, a breakdown 